It was a rough day for Michael Soroka and the rest of the Braves on Tuesday for a variety of reasons, including Michael Soroka's season coming to an unfortunate end. We'll discuss all of that on today's episode of Lockdown Braves, so let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Lockdown Parade, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Also, make sure you check out my written work over at bravestoday.com. Make sure you follow the podcast on X at lockdown underscore braves. Uh, submit, submit any questions, comments, feedback that you have for the podcast. Try to make this as interactive with you as possible and another place to do that is over on youtube so if you're watching there and you're not subscribed please do so trying to get to 7,000 subscribers by the postseason we're up over 6,800 so thank you so much for the support there and one way to help that is to like this video i know it sounds ridiculous everybody asked for it but please if you just could hit that thumbs up button and you've been doing a fantastic job of doing that almost 200 likes on just about every episode there's always that one person who gives me a dislike hey that's fine. That's your prerogative. But thank you so much for all those who hit the thumbs up button. I want to give a shout out to some of our every dares of Locked On Braves. You got Daniel Acevedo from Puerto Rico, Kevin O'Boyle, who listens on Apple, but came over to YouTube just to leave a comment and let me know. I appreciate you doing that, Kevin. Jordan Zier87, who says he's just subscribed, trying to help me get to 7K. So thank you for that, Jordan. Greg Harris, RJS2303, who watches at lunch. Hope you're having a good lunch today out there, RJ, and Michael Richie as well. So thank you so much for letting me know that you're an everydayer of the podcast. And if you would like to let me know, please do so in the comment section below on YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. On today's episode, we'll talk about that unfortunate game on Tuesday. Just rough for a lot of reasons, particularly the news surrounding Michael Soroka. We'll discuss all that and his performance, which looks really bad in the line score. But when you look at how he actually threw the ball the majority of the game, he had some good moments in there that still give you hope that you can unlock Michael Soroka in the future. But got to get healthy. We'll discuss all that. The offense did its best to crawl out of that. Some unfortunate results with some good batted balls. On Tuesday as well, we'll get into all of that. And then in our second segment today, we'll do our stat of the day Wednesday. And then I'm also going to combine through the league Thursday, tell you about the games you need to watch this coming up weekend as we prepare for the postseason. Didn't want to go two weeks without a stat of the day Wednesday and through the league Thursday. So we'll combine both of those as again, I will not be here Thursday and Friday. There will not be a Thursday and Friday podcast. I'm headed to the beach and needed a much needed vacation for me and my family. So looking forward to that. Um, all right, so let's jump into it. Tuesday's game, big loss to the Cardinals, 10 to six, fall behind nine to one in that game. Tried to make a little bit of a comeback, but fell just short. But let's start out with Michael Soroka. It was a rough start, no doubt about it. Three innings, four hits, one walk, five earned, all on home runs. One, as mentioned, the one walk and six strikeouts. So six strikeouts in three innings is great. And again, there's some really good stuff in here. I've also maintained going back, you can go back to that start in Oakland. And when I, I talked about that performance after he had it, I said, the one thing for Soroka is that fastball and sinker command until that he figures that out. And look, the guy hasn't pitched for, you know, over two and a half years coming into this season. That's, you know, we say with people who have Tommy John surgery, the last thing to come is the command. Well, this is a guy who's had two Achilles injuries and been out for over two years. So you can imagine that he's still trying to find the command. Not only that, a guy who had to rework his entire rotation. And I just think, you know, obviously that's still coming along, but until he can figure out that fastball sinker location. We're not even going to see him, you know, get a glimpse of him back to what he previously was. And maybe he never does get back to that level. I still think he can be a really good pitcher. I think even with what he has right now, I think he can be a really good fourth or fifth starter in a rotation. But clearly that fastball sinker command, it's been something that has plagued him from the beginning since he started coming back. 
And it was effective with the fastball up in the zone, but that sinker, he didn't throw a single sinker below the knees. It's just that sinker is a pitch that was so good for him before, and it just feels like, again, with the new mechanics and how he's having to throw the ball now to try to avoid injury, it's just it feels like he's not able to get on top of that sinker and he's not able to get that downward action, and it's just flattening out over the middle of the plate and it's getting hit extremely hard. So that's something he's going to have to figure out Forcing fastball, it's just it's too flat. He had some success with it up in the zone when he when he got it high enough. It was able to have some ride up at the top of the zone, but when he missed that spot and left it over the middle of the plate like he did Tyler O'Neill, it's gonna get hit really hard. It's just he doesn't have that velocity on it, and when you don't command it, it's gonna hit, get hit particularly hard at the big league level. You just can't miss over the plate with four seam flat fastballs like that. So. That right me right there is still the key to me with Michael Soroka and him getting back to somebody who can be a consistently good big league pitcher. He's got to figure out that fastball command or he just needs to play more off of the slider because the slider is still a devastating pitch. And you saw that on Tuesday night, how good of a slider he has and just how great it can be, especially when he can get it over for strikes down and away to righties and then run it off that plate for strikeouts when he needs to or drop it just below the zone. I thought he had great control of that slider, and it may be something going forward where it's a pitch that he needs to focus on being maybe one of his more primary pitches or at least a little bit more even with the fastball to get hitters off of that fastball. Because for me, if I'm a hitter right now, I'm spitting on everything you know, down and away, and I'm looking for something up. And I'm going to sit on that and hope I get that fastball and I'm going to try and crush it as a couple of Cardinals did on this night. And that's really, you know, what it comes down to. You look at the peripherals for Michael Soroka, 79.8 mile per hour average X velocity against. That is absurdly good. I mean, you're really looking for something in the mid 80s. He's in the 70s with average X velocity against on this night. Granted, it's a small sample size. He only pitched three innings, but he only gave up two hard hit balls and both of them left the park and left the park in a hurry. Again, missing location with fastballs, one, a fastball up middle up to Tyler O'Neill that he crushed. And then a fastball, it was kind of low in a way, but still too much middle of the plate for Nolan Gorman, who just dropped the bat head on it and drove it out to the left center on a really good swing. That was really the only two hard hit ball or it was the only two hard hit balls he gave up. Unfortunately, the first one came after a couple of bloop hits. Arenado beat the shift going the other way. Jordan Walker blooped in a double just out of the reach around a diving around Acuna Jr. And then you give up the three run homer. That's tough. And then the second home run came after a walk, which is obviously of his own doing so. Again, just unfortunate timing on those home runs, having multiple runners on base. So hate that for Soroka, who I felt threw the ball a lot better than his line score is going to tell you. And I get it. There's people out here says all that matters is how many runs you give up. And I get that. But still, I thought he threw the ball much better than his line looked. Eight whiffs on 19 swings. That's a 42% whiff rate. That's just insane. A four Whiffs on six sliders. Like I said, that slider is still just a devastating pitch. 15 called strikes. He had a 38% called strike plus whiff uh, number or percentage on this night in just 60 pitches. So, again, certainly some bad in there. He's got to figure out that fastball command, but that slider is still such a devastating pitch. It gives you hope that Soroka is still in there. I know there's a little bit of fan bias coming out of me because I just want to see him succeed, but – Again, when I watch him pitch, I just feel like if he can figure out that fastball command, avoid that flat fastball over the middle of the plate, and maybe work ahead with that slider a little bit more, he can still be a really effective pitcher. So, unfortunately, he did leave the game early with a hand injury, which I'll talk about more a little bit. I'll talk about more later, later in the podcast, but he did unfortunately leave this game. But I want to get to the rest of this game first. Cardinals lineup was really good. I kind of hinted at that coming in. They're ninth in baseball in OPS, eighth in home runs. So that's just something to note, not just for this game, to make excuses for Soroka, who can only give up two hard-hit balls. But going forward in this series, as you look at this Cardinals lineup, offense has not really been their problem this year. It's been pitching. So this is a very good lineup and a good test for this Braves pitching staff. But frustrating night for the offense. They absolutely crushed 
Miles Michaelis, but couldn't get the results. 96.9 mile per hour average exit velocity against Michaelis. I mentioned Soroka's average exit velocity against almost 20 points lower than what it was against Michaelis. He had just four whiffs on 42 swings. Nobody was missing. He wasn't really fooling anybody. 11 hard hit balls against Michaelis, just five of them for hits. 21 balls put in play against Michaelis were hit 92 miles per hour or harder. So, look, the offense scored six runs. They did its job. This is clearly this game's clearly on the pitching staff, but it just felt like there could have been more done offensively. Just some bad, bad at ball luck, some great plays defensively behind Michaelis for the Cardinals, but somewhat of a frustrating night for a night where you score six runs and double-digit hits for your offense. They also just couldn't get that big hit with runners in scoring position, one for nine with runners in scoring position. So really just couldn't get that big hit. And, you know, one thing about this offense, we know you can never count them out. Even when they give up nine runs early, they're down nine to one. You just felt like there was a rally in them. And in that eighth inning, really had a chance there, second and third with Acuna coming up. He grounds into, uh, gets an RBI ground out, but in that inning, Comes to an end next at bat with Ozzy getting out as well. But they were right there, and they had a chance, forced the Cardinals to use their better bullpen arms. And now you got kind of them taxed, and you got Strider and Freed ready to come in these next two games, set you up for an opportunity to still win this series. But this offense, just can never count them out. They're just too good. Olsen and Riley both with homers. Good to see that, particularly Olsen, get that home run swing going again. Michael Harris with a good night. A couple of hits, also made a great catch in center field. As for the Acuna watch, 0 for 5, had five hard-hit balls. That is very difficult to do, to go over 5 and hit the ball that hard all five times. He's now 0 for his last 12, so he is due, I guess you could say. We don't see too many over 12s from Ronald Acuna Jr. Again, still hitting the ball extremely hard, just having a little bit of, of tough luck himself. I said, you know, maybe he's pressing a little bit too much, maybe trying to get the home runs. I don't know if that's the case. I don't have any evidence to back that up. But either way, he's still hitting the ball hard. He's going to obviously snap out of this. Just some bad luck here these last couple of games. All right, next we're going to go into our stat of the day Wednesday. We're going to talk about the fifth starter spot and how bad they've been and how much this offense has helped cover that up. We'll also go through our Through the League Thursday slash Wednesday segment on today's podcast. We'll talk about that next. Are you struggling to close deals? Could outreach cold outreach is wasting the time of both the buyer and seller at every stage, especially when sellers are using shallow and outdated data? Your organization can overcome these challenges with technology that translate comprehensive, high-quality buyer data into real-time insights. These deeper insights empower sales reps and teams to adopt the habits of top performers, which leads to better outcomes, like more pipeline, higher win rates, and larger deals. LinkedIn calls this deep sales, and we built LinkedIn has built the first deep sales platform with the next generation of LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at LinkedIn.com slash locked on. That is LinkedIn.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to LinkedIn.com slash MLB to get started. All right, it'll be the Braves and the Cardinals again on Wednesday night, starting at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app, Search Braves. All right, we'll do our stat of the day, a Wednesday segment here first. And our stat of the day is 6.17 ERA. That is the quote-unquote ERA for the Braves' fifth starter this year. Uh, that is the combined ERA of Schuster, Torino, Soroka, Winans, A.J. smith Shaver, Colby Allard, Dylan Dodd, and Darius Vines this season. Now, those guys have combined for 37 starts, so this is more than just the fifth starter. These guys have had to cover you know, for other guys as well, and a normal workload right now for a fifth starter would be 27 starts, so we're talking about 10 more starts, but still, these are the guys they've tried to fit into the back of the rotation this year because of injuries and everything going on with the Braves rotation. You've gotten 10 starts out of Schuster, a 5.26 ERA. Five starts out of Yanni Torinos, a 9.27 ERA. Six starts now out of Michael Soroka, a 6.40 ERA. Alan Winans has three starts with a 5.17. AJ Smith-Shaver, four starts with a 5.12. 
Allard, three starts with a 5.56. Five, Dylan Dodd, five starts with a 7.40. And Darius Vines, one start with a 3.00 ERA. So you can see right there, it's been pretty rough for the Braves this year. Yes, they've had plenty of depth to cover these innings and get these starts, but no one has particularly grabbing, grabbed one of these roles and latched onto it. You see nobody except for Vines, who has just one start, has an ERA under five this season. And a lot of them, it's limited sample sizes. And a lot of these guys, as I mentioned, they're getting bounced back and forth, which I just personally don't think is the best thing in the world. Um, but again, they haven't come up and they haven't earned that opportunity to get another start in the rotation. You could argue Winans did early on and they sent him down and then brought him back up and Vines, you know, you can say what he did in Coors probably deserved another opportunity, but they sent him right back down. So uh, again, I'm not going to get on my soapbox again. I just don't love the, the yo-yoing back and forth with some of these guys. You're going to give them a chance like you did Chirinos, give them four or five starts, see what they can do, especially at this point of the season or even the last month of the season where you had such a big lead and you had the opportunity to do that. All that said, some of these guys have had mixed results. They've come up, they've had good starts mixed in with really bad starts, which kind of leads to the ERA that they have. What I think is really crazy when you look at these fifth starters and you look at these starts that all these guys have had and how bad their ERAs are, again, a 6.17 combined ERA from all these guys through 37 starts this year. And the Braves record in these games is 23 and 14. I don't know about you, but when I was putting this together, that just absolutely blew my mind. The fact that these guys have a combined ERA of 6.17. And yet the Braves record in these starts by these pitchers is 23 and 14. They're five and five when Jared Schuster starts, four and one when Johnny Torino starts, despite a 9.27 ERA, four and two in Soroka's outings, three and one in AJ Smith Shaver, one and two with Allard, four and one with Dylan Dodd, despite a 7.40 ERA, and one and zero oh with Darius Fine. So, you know, outside of Winans and and Allard, they have a winning record or at least a 500 record in the case of Schuster with everybody else. They're 23 and 14 in those 37 games despite a 6.17 ERA. So what does that tell you about this team? It tells you a couple things in my mind. This offense covers up a lot of mistakes. And we've talked about that before whether it's the errors or it's, you know, the the pitching staff, the fifth starter spot where they have struggled. This offense covers up a lot of mistakes. That's just how good this offense is. Can you count on them to cover up those mistakes in the postseason? That's what remains to be seen. And I hope that's the case. And I think they can because I don't I don't really think it matters the opponent and the pitcher. Certainly they're going to face some really good pitching in the postseason, but I think this lineup is so deep and so good and so talented. I, I don't know that the competition matters all that much. I think they're going to be able to score some runs and put up some runs no matter who it is, but can they overcome a lot of these mistakes? And you're not going to see these starting pitchers. You're not going to see Schuster, you know, Winans, Allard, Dodd. You're not going to see these guys starting in a postseason game anyway, but can they overcome some of those other mistakes, the walks that we've talked about, the the base running mistakes we've seen lately, the, the errors or the misplays or the plays that aren't made on defense? Can this offense continue to cover up those mistakes? But they're a big reason why the Braves are 23 and 14 in those 37 starts despite the troubling ERA from those guys. I think the other part, the aspect you have to give credit to is the bullpen. Uh, the bullpen's done a great job when these guys have come out, whether you know it's been McHugh at times, a lot of times, trying to bridge that gap, Tonkin as well, Jesse Chavez, maybe earlier in the season, trying to bridge that gap when these guys have come out after you know four, four plus innings, giving up four or five runs. They've done a real good job of bridging that gap to the back end of the bullpen. So, you don't win these games unless, one, you got a big offense, and two, you got a bullpen that once these guys leave, they do a good job of putting up zeros and giving your offense a chance to get back in the game. So 
I, I point this out mainly because I want to give a lot of props to the offense who has overcome that in the bullpen as well. And I think that should give you a lot of confidence going into the postseason when, again, you're not going to have a Torino start. You're not going to have a Dylan Dodd start. You're not going to have, uh, you know, a Jared Schuster start. But you still have this offense and you still have this bullpen who has helped you go 23 and 14 when those pitchers have started despite a 6.17 ERA. That just blew my mind. Uh, hopefully you found that as interesting as I did. Now I want to shift gears and go through our Through the League segment. No, I didn't do one last week and we'll have a podcast tomorrow. So kind of want to just touch on what's going on around the league as we go down the stretch here. Just looking at the divisions, Orioles are up three and a half games on the Rays, feeling pretty safe there at this point. Twins just dominated the Guardians in a series. They're up seven games in the AL Central. They've pretty much locked that up at this point. The Astros, Mariners, and Rangers are all separated by two games in the AL West. That's become a really fun race with the Astros now back on top. In the NL East, the Braves are up 14 and a half games on the Phillies. Their magic number right now is 11 as the Phillies lost. One good thing about this time of year, when you're in the spot the Braves are, you can lose a game like the Braves lost on Tuesday, and it can still be a good day if the team behind you loses, or even in the case of the Dodgers, they lost. So the Braves knock off another magic number towards having the best record in the National League as well. But the Braves are up 14 and a half games on the Phillies, who own the top wild card spot, which again, just tells you how great the Braves have been. Marlins are 19 and a half back. The Mets 26 and a half back. And the Nationals are 29 games back. They had playing a little good, good baseball there for a minute. They've now lost six in a row, and they've fallen back into the cellar of the NL East. In the NL Central, the Brewers are up two and a half games on the Cubs, five and a half on the Reds. And the AL West, the Dodgers are up 14 games on the Diamondbacks. So those are your division standings. Now, as for what to watch this upcoming weekend, if you're you're like me and you just want to watch some good you know, pennant race baseball here down the stretch as teams fight for playoff spots. You got Houston and Texas playing right now. I think there's one game left in that series, maybe two games left. Um, Houston has dominated the first two games of that series, so we'll see if Texas has any fight left in them. Perhaps the reigning World Series champions are hitting their stride at the right time. Again, they've taken over the top of that division, but still in a really good race. Seattle mixed in that as well, and they are currently playing at Cincinnati with the Reds being in a tight NL wild card race that includes four teams separated by just one game as they battle for that final spot. So that's going to be a lot of fun to watch as well, that Reds team. Uh, fun team to watch, uh, so certainly going to be looking out for that. The Reds currently own the final spot for the NL wild card just a half game over the Marlins and one game over the Diamondbacks this weekend, or no, sorry, right now the Dodgers are playing uh, Miami. So Braves are rooting for Miami to take down the Dodgers as they did on Tuesday night to help the Braves get that top NL spot for record. Uh, I mentioned the Reds play in Seattle. They're fighting for that NL wild card spot. The Giants at the Cubs right now is a really good series. The Cubs have the second wild card spot and the Giants just two games back of that final spot. So that's a good series to watch at the moment as well. Coming up this weekend, you got the Diamondbacks at the Cubs. Uh, that will be a very important series for the NL wild card. And you got Miami at Philadelphia this weekend. So we'll see if the Marlins can get hot. Maybe somebody can chase down the Phillies because as it stands today, the Braves would be that top spot. And so they would play the winner of the Phillies and the Cubs. So, We'll see if that shakes up. Right now, both of those teams are pretty firmly in those top two wild card spots, so it's looking like that's who the Braves are going to play. So might be a good idea just to watch those teams anyway and get a feel for what they look like as that is likely to be the Braves' opponent in the NLDS this year. So that's just a look at what's coming up and through the league right now, some of the standings and some games to watch. So hopefully you enjoy that this weekend as the Braves are playing the Cardinals and the Pirates. All right, next we'll preview the next game for the Cardinals and the Braves where Spencer Strider takes them out. Also got some news to get to, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that Michael Soroka injury. We'll discuss all of that here next. Get ready for the NFL season starting this Thursday night with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get to bet, can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. 
Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. Visit FanDuel.com slash play safe for tools and resources to help you stay in control of the way you play. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Braves will be back on Wednesday night against the Cardinals at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app, Search Braves. So the new segment of this, unfortunately, is kind of full for good and bad reasons. We'll start with the bad, and that is Soroka heading to the injured list with numbness in his fingers. Now, hate this just off the rip. I hate this for Michael Soroka, what he's been through, going through those two Achilles injuries, battling back and then having this kind of end his season abruptly. Now, the good thing is that we're basically at the end of the year. Um, so, you know, he's gotten basically a full workload in for this season, especially coming back when you knew the Braves were going to limit his innings anyway. So, you know, that's the one good thing that it's happening now and not in the middle of the season and kind of disrupting him, although the Braves in the way they handled him, I think maybe disrupted him, but they were kind of forced into that uh, needing pitchers in the rotation Try not to get sidetracked on that again, but hate this for Soroka. But again, it's coming at the end of the season, so makes sense to sh- just to shut him down um, and just go ahead and wrap him up for the year, which I'm assuming is going to happen. Uh, I guess there's a, technically enough days left on the calendar that he could come back at the end if this were to clear up, but I got to imagine they're not going to take any chances with Soroka and just go ahead and shut him down for the season. I, I'm not a, a doctor. I'm not an expert. My wife's a physical therapist. I just asked her, and obviously she didn't have a chance to evaluate him, but I asked her what could cause numbness in the finger. She said it could be possible inflammation in the elbow or perhaps a herniated disc. So, again, I don't know the extent of those. I'm sure he's going to get his the proper care. Hopefully it's nothing serious. We'll get more information about that, I'm sure, here pretty soon. But hopefully it's nothing serious and he can work his way back, have a good offseason, get ready for next year. Again, I'm assuming – his season is done, but we'll see what happens there. Just hate it for Soroka for if this is the way that his season ends to end like that with another injury. Now, the other question is, is he going to get major league service time? Yes. If you are on the major league injured list, you still collect service time. So the Braves likely are not going to gain that extra year of control, which is just confusing. Uh, again, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole again and go through with the, the handling of Soroka this year and how they've done that, but it's looking like he's going to get enough service time this year that he will uh, become a free agent after the next season. So, again, I, I don't care about that at this point. I just care about the health of Soroka and hate it for that guy, and hopefully he can come back healthy. Uh, also, Von Grissom went on the IL at Gwinnett with a hip injury, so a bit unfortunate there. I know some of you, myself included, were hoping to see Von Grissom maybe get another opportunity later in the year, see what he could do and possible fit for the postseason roster. Again, there's still time left. He could come back this year, but he was put on the injured list. And then on the good front, Kyle Wright, another rehab start, three and two-thirds innings, just one hit, did walk two batters, no one runs, and seven strikeouts. Through 50 pitches, 29 strikes. If they bump him up to 70, 75 pitches his next time out and keep him on five days rest, he could be back by the 15th and then maybe get three to four regular season starts. I think that's best case scenario. Um, but again, we'll see how they got to see how the next start goes. But you know, we could see him make one more rehab start and then return. I wouldn't be surprised if he made two more rehab starts and then maybe gets two or three starts at the at the major league level at the end of the season, but certainly an encouraging one for Kyle Wright on Tuesday night. All right, setting you up for game two between the Cardinals and the Braves is Dakota Hudson versus Spencer Strider. Hudson's gone at least five innings and given up three earned or less in his past six starts. Uh, essentially, since he rejoined the rotation, they had moved him to the bullpen, so he's been really solid. Uh, here lately, seven innings pitched, three hits, two walks, one earned, no strikeouts against Pittsburgh his last time out. Sinker baller gets a lot of ground balls. Slider gets a lot of whiffs as well. So he's got a good sinker, sinker slider combination. You know, kind of hoping what Michael Soroka can get back to. So we'll see how that works out for Hudson in this game. Strider, avoid the long ball. That's my one key with him. Again, it just feels like 
a lot of games this year. He's been just absolutely dominating and then gives up a bloop, walks a batter, gives up a three-run homer, and it just blows up his final line. So we want to see him avoid the long ball or at least make sure nobody's on base when you do so. And we saw how powerful this Cardinals lineup can be. So that's my key with Spencer Strider. We know how dominating he can be, but can he avoid that two three run homer and put up another really good line of two earned or less continue to lower that ERA and try to get back in that NL Cy Young discussion. He's in that discussion, but try to continue to make his case to win the award. Again, it'll be Spencer Strider and Dakota Hudson on Wednesday night as the Braves take on the Cardinals at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Braves. Thanks for making Lockdown Braves your first listen of each and every day. That will do it for this episode of Lockdown Braves. Make sure you follow us on X at Lockdown underscore Braves. Follow me at Shortstop Ball. Also, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast. And we will talk to you next time.